So you'll probably all get a wee warning now that says this is now being recorded. Turn your camera off, you don't be seen, etc. But that's us now recording. And over to Liz to introduce tonight's speaker. Hello there. So welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm one of the committee members and I've, it's been my job this year to book speakers uh, for our talk. So uh, I had first come across Danielle. Danielle doesn't know this, but I had first come across Danielle when she was posting photographs of lovely photographs online. Um, and I got so I got to know of her name. And in fact, she helped me with some ID work and she wouldn't have known who I was at that time. Um, and then uh, I um, I stopped seeing those photographs because I came off a certain social media platform. And uh, but subsequently I came across it online uh, being interviewed. Uh, so I thought she was a wonderful speaker. And uh, I thought, ha ha, she's somebody I must contact. So she was one of those wonderful people who just immediately say yes, you know, when you ask them to do something really awkward. <laughs> so this is Danielle coming to tell us about the um, about uh, the dragonflies of Scotland. Also about, I think she'll say a bit about local hotspots for, uh, for dragonflies in our area. And then obviously you'll have a chance to put questions in the chat to ask her whatever you would like. Okay, so I very much welcome you, Danielle, tonight. And uh, I'll pass over to you now. Okay, thanks very much, Liz. That was a very nice introduction. Um, I shall just share my screen. I shall just let everyone know that, um, as I was saying to Stuart, technologically useless. So fingers crossed that this works. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes. Excellent. And does it have a dragonfly on it? It does. Fab. Right, I'm just going to uh, move my laptop lid down, I'm afraid, uh, just so that I can get a better view of my big screen. But yes, yeah, so I'm here today to, to talk about Dragonflies of Scotland. Um, as Liz said, my name's uh, Danielle Muir. I'm Conservation Officer here in um, for, to, to cover Scotland. And the presentation tonight is going to be about uh, the basic ecology of dragonflies, a bit about their habitats. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll move on to hotspots, some recording and what we've done over the past few years to help conservation of our, our rare species. Um, so moving on, um, I hope you hope you enjoy these lovely pictures of these wonderful insects. Uh, a bit more about me. So I work for the BDS for, for two and a half days a week. Uh, in the rest of the rest of my time, I run um, a little micro business called Persia Wildlife, um, where I, I run beaver tours during the summer. I grow native wildflowers and run a few conservation projects as well. And uh, the business turned ten years old last year, which was which was quite exciting. So we're still having a few celebratory events um, this year. So I've worked as a ranger and a wildlife guide for about twenty five years now. And I've worked for the BDS for 10 years, just over 10 years. Um, and my role has changed quite a bit somewhat, quite a bit in that time. So I'll be talking about, as I said, a few different things. So just thinking about how long have uh, dragonflies been around? Well, dragonflies um, have been around for over 300 million years. So that's since before the time of the dinosaurs. Um, and at that time, they had well, they had they had massive ancestors. They had sort of like a two and a half foot wingspan. So if you compare that to our dragonflies today, which the largest ones that we have here in Scotland maybe have about a 10, 10 centimeter wingspan, so they would have been quite scary insects to come across um, in those in those days, I think. Um, so this is a beautiful fossil of one of these. Uh, Meg Meganisoptera giant dragonflies. And dragonflies belong to the order Odonata, which means toothed jaw. And when we're talking about dragonflies, we mean <clears throat> dragonflies and damselflies. Dragonflies are Anisoptera, which means um, true dragonflies or uneven wings, as you can see in this picture on the left of a broad body chaser. They're, um, the four wings are a slightly different shape to the rear wings. And if we have a look at damselflies on the right hand side, which are, are zygoptera, which means paired or joined wings, then um, you can see that their wings, their four wings and their rear wings are the, are the same shape. And there are over 5,000 species worldwide with more towards the, the, the numbers increasing towards the equator. 
120 species in Europe, 47 breeding in Britain and Ireland. And up until a few years ago, we had 23 species breeding in Scotland. However, I'm sure that that number will have increased by a few um, in the last few years, because if you look at maps, if we look at today's atlases and compare them to atlases of 20 years ago, 30 years ago, as with all insects, I'm sure, you can really see how so many southern species have been pushing uh, pushing further north. And we now have species sort of in the highlands that um, they, they were only in five 20 years ago. I'm just I'm thinking about the azure damselfly as, as an example. So here in Scotland, we have nine species of damselfly, 14 species, species of dragonfly. Um, and we have four more species possibly breeding. Now, the brown walker I have seen near Hamilton, and I'm sure that there are species, there are, sorry, there are sites where the brown walker must be breeding in between um, sort of the borders and, and that site in Hamilton. It's too far. Well, not necessarily too far for them to have flown otherwise, but it, there must be there must be sort of stepping stone populations in between. Migrant hawker, um, we're getting more and more um, sightings of a species such as migrant hawker throughout the country. Broad body chaser, we're getting lots of reports of um, of them breeding round about um, Edinburgh and the Lothians. And black-tailed skimmer as well, I think, has come over the border and will now be breeding, breeding in the borders or maybe in Dumfries and Galloway. And we have a number of migrant species, including the yellow-winged darter and red-veined darter. And we have three very special species that are found only within Scotland and the UK, the northern damselfly, the azure hawker and the northern emerald. And you'll, you'll hear a bit more about them as we go on in the sort of second half of the talk about conservation. But this is a, a, a northern uh, damselfly here. So northern damselflies, they're, they're, they're quite rare species, uh, only found in about 70 odd sites across Scotland. And they're sort of clustered round about the Cairngorm. So there's a a population in Deeside, a population in Strathspey, and a population in Perthshire as well. They're fairly easy to identify. Um, can you see my mouse moving around here? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So they have this, can you see just underneath where my, my pointer is, There's. it's almost like an ace of spades shape. It has little black marks down the, the side at the top of the, the abdomen here. And it's got sort of bluey, bluey green colouring on the, the thorax there. Um, and also bright pea green underside to the eye. So this is this is one from a population not far from me in Perthshire, um, up at, at Logie Rate. Um, and this is the, the male, the male's the black and white one and the female's uh, a lovely pea green colour, as you can see here. And this is a picture of a larva on the left and um, one of the sites at Castle Fraser near, well, in Aberdeenshire. Um, this is our first uh, dragonfly key site in Scotland. Uh, key sites are, are, are uh, basically sites where there's rare species and we work with the, the landowner to try and improve the, the habitat or the management for the rare dragonflies. So um, at, and at, at Castle Fraser, somebody had put some fish in the main pond um, where the northern damselflies had been doing very well up until then. And there'd been uh, surveys carried on, I think, for about 20 years now, or uh, certainly a minimum of 15 at Castle Fraser. And we could see from the from the um, the data that the population of northern damselfly was really, had really fallen, which was probably as a result of somebody putting the fish in the pond. And... Um, so Castle Fraser is run by the NTS. They um, dug this new pond, not that far from the original pond, and the northern damselfly um, colonised it the following year, which was which was wonderful because we didn't really know how likely, um, how how soon that they would uh, find the pond and, and breed in there. But it was the following year, so that's great news. Um, <clears throat> but more about northern damselfly to come as well. Northern emerald is the, the next sort of endemic species, though th these three are found out with the UK, they are found throughout Europe. Um, so th this is a, a bog pool species, and um, this is one that's just emerged from a wonderful site near Benny on Benny NNR, and you can see it, it lives in a sort of, they're, they're uh, bog, bog pool species. Um, and these these are the larvae taken by um, Luigi, who recently did his master's on habitat preferences of northern emeralds. And that was at Stirling University. 
Um, so Northern Emerald larvae are, are really quite distinctive. You can see they've got a very round, I would normally say a very round bottom, though that's not very scientific. So the end of their abdomen is very rounded. They're very hairy and there's always lots of um, detritus gets caught up in their in the hairs on their body. So they're they're very well camouflaged. Um, and this is uh, a, a one emerging from the it's it's lovely sphag, sphagnumy pool. And um, this was in Glen Canich a few years ago. Um, sadly, I think this site has been destroyed by the wildfires um, that took place there last year. But um, it's wonderful to see, and we'll do. You'll have a you'll have a, a bit more about um, emergence. Um, in a few minutes, but this is the size of the, the larva. This is the larval skin that the adults emerged from. If you look at the size of that and compare that to the size of the adult once it's sort of pumped the fluid around its body. And um, it's just amazing to think that that creature came from in there. And Azure Hawker is the, the third uh, the third species found within Scotland, only found within Scotland in the UK. And this is sort of like the top of the dragonfly fans uh, tick list every year I get many uh, emails about where can I see um, azure hawkers and they are beautiful beautiful insects as you can see from these photos um, despite having worked with VDS for 10 years and having looked for these uh, lovely insects on many occasions I have still to see <laughs> well get a good sighting I should say of an adult azure hawker um, so they are they are very elusive, except for the occasional person who can take these wonderful photos. Um, and I'll talk about Azure Hawker quite, quite a bit more in the conservation section. So a bit back to back to the sort of ecology of dragonflies. Dragonflies are predators, and they'll um, they're also predated upon by various things such as spiders, wasps, raptors, such as this hobby. Hobbies are very keen on, they're, they're very well adapted to catching dragonflies, bee eaters as well, and they'll also predate each other. Um, so the picture we have here on the right is a golden ring dragonfly uh, eating a bumblebee, I think. I've seen golden ring dragonflies eating bumblebees, wasps, butterflies, uh, damselflies. So they basically catch whatever they can find, um, including midges. So they can eat hundreds and hundreds of midges a, get, a day. So that's uh, obviously great news for us and they've got a really high hunting success rate far higher than any mammals and they are uh, ambush hunters um, <clears throat> quite often they'll just wait on a perch and wait for some prey to fly past and I have a little film here to to show you about um, how they hunt this pea shooter might be low tech but it's the perfect tool to recreate a high-speed target for our dragonfly. It fires out seeds so quickly, our eyes can't possibly see them. But is the dragonfly's vision quick enough to spot it? We're gonna have a look back at our slow motion clip. Will the dragonfly detect the tiny pea? The dragonfly is completely still. And the head definitely turns before we see the seed come into frame. And then the dragonfly almost takes off, but it has enough time to assess that it's not a fly, and it changes its mind and stays on its perch. That's incredible. The head definitely moves first. The dragonfly's vision is so quick it can track the flying object and work out it's not prey, all in less than five hundredths of a second. It's partly due to the speed at which they process information. Dragonflies experience time in a completely different way to us. They have a reaction time of 30 milliseconds far faster than ours. The whole process of seeing a fly, taking off and catching it, can happen in about the same time it would simply take us to react in any way.
But there's something even more astonishing about the dragonfly's vision. To demonstrate, Patrick has a flicker book. If I flick this book fast enough, the images begin to animate. And that's because the pages are moving so fast we hardly notice them turning. It's essentially an optical illusion. Although our vision appears to be seamless, our eyes actually work by capturing up to 60 images a second. Our brain then combines them to create the illusion of a continuous moving image. Because the pages are turning faster than that, it brings the animation to life. To a dragonfly, however, this would look completely different. The images would appear slowed down, and it would see each individual page turning. And that's because dragonflies see faster than we do. Whereas we see 60 images per second, they see around 200. And so they can observe things that are just too fast for even us to process. In real time, it's impossible for us to see exactly what this dragonfly is doing. But using our high-speed camera that slows down the action 80 times, we're able to reveal the astonishing accuracy of a dragonfly's vision as it catches a tiny midge in mid-air. Dragonflies have been around for 300 million years since before the dinosaurs. In this time, they fine-tuned their eyes to see their world in slow motion. Well, you can see from that, they, they have absolutely superb vision and they've got the largest eyes of, of all insects with over 20,000 facets, which are almost like sort of mini lenses um, in each eye. Um, <clears throat> and they can fly really fast. They're very aerodynamic. They can fly forward, obviously. They can reverse. They can go up. They can go down. They can um, sort of like whiz around. Uh, they're fast Fast flyers, 25 to 30 miles an hour from an insect, pretty amazing. And they beat their wings um, at 30 beats a second. So they're just they're just looking at their flight and the way they hunt. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. And then looking at the dragonfly life cycle, um, if we start off with with uh, eggs. Um, so the females will lay eggs um, either in plants underwater, close to the edge of the water, um, some lay their eggs in sort of rotting wood close to the edge of the water, and some will lay their eggs directly into the water itself. And then the larvae will hatch out, um, larvae or nymphs, and they'll live underwater between, well, here in Scotland, um, it's usual that uh, um, a damselfly will take two years for their life cycle. A dragonfly can take up to six years for their life cycle. And when they're underwater, they're voracious predators, as they are on land, and they feed on basically anything they can catch. So things like water fleas, freshwater shrimps, um, freshwater slaters, little hog lice, um, water worms, all sorts of things like that. Each other, of course, so... Um, and when they're underwater, they shed their skin so that they can they can grow bigger because their exoskeleton's their protection. It doesn't stretch. So they have to grow a new um, a new skin um, every so often, and they can shed their skin up to about eighteen times as as they get bigger. And after they've they've grown big enough to emerge, um, the larvae will climb out of the water on plant stems, rushes, or reeds, or uh, yellow flag stems. Maybe they're emerging from. Um, from the water and then the adult emerges and we're going to see a nice little video about emergence and then um, once the adult is able to fly it will probably fly off to somewhere where it can um, feed for for a few days um, where it develops its adult adult colors and it's only when it's ready to to breed especially for the females that they'll return to the water body um, and then it's the male the male uh, mates with the female um so they they 
it's called in copper in copulation. So the male will have his um, clasp. He's got claspers on the end of his abdomen. He holds on to the female and the female brings the end of her abdomen up to, he's got a secondary genitalia just underneath the, the front of his abdomen. She picks up a sperm packet and that fertilizes her eggs. And then that's when she goes on to, to lay eggs. So it's, a, a, and again, <laughs> dragonflies have an amazing, um, uh, an amazing life cycle. So we can see this picture on the left here. This is the, the larva emerging. Uh, it's quite a scary looking creature, that one. And on the right hand side here, this is a, a common hawker emerging. I, I think I took this at Gartkosh, um, Gartkosh hotspot, which is a wonderful place to see common hawkers. And this is a little video about emergence. Um, so some really nice footage here. After two and a half years living below the surface, the nymph is ready to undertake a final molt that will see it leaving its aquatic home and embarking on a final journey to pass on its genes to the next generation. Just before dawn, on a warm July day, the nymph climbs up a reed stem and sits motionless. A few minutes later, the carapace above the thorax begins to split and the dragonfly begins to ease itself out of the nymph's exoskeleton. The dragonfly waits as its legs harden enough for it to support itself. As it reorients itself and begins the slow process of unfolding its wings, the dragonfly flexes, stretching the still supple exoskeleton, steadily elongating and expanding to reach its full adult size. Once the wings are fully extended, the powerful muscles in the dragon's thorax reorient the wings into their final horizontal position. The dragonfly is now almost ready to take its maiden flight. Tremors in the flight muscle are the first sign of impending departure. And finally, 12 hours after emerging as a nymph from below the surface of the pond, the flight muscles burst into life and the dragonfly floats up into the afternoon sunshine. The pale and fragile dragonfly must now find a quiet spot to roost while its exoskeleton hardens and develops the rich colour scheme of the adult dragonfly. So when it comes to identification, um, these things that I'm just about to take you through are quite handy to know. Um, so when it comes to identifying dragonflies on the left-hand side here, um, well, first of all, to tell the difference between dragonflies and damselflies, there's maybe three or four things to bear in mind. Dragonflies are much chunkier, bigger insects than damselflies, which I'm sure I'm sure you all know. Um, dragon our dragonflies can be up to about ten centimeters long. Um, whereas damselflies are about the size size of matchsticks. Um, if you were to, to look at their eyes when they've landed, as you can see on the picture on the left of the dragonfly, the eyes take pretty much up the whole of the head and they, they meet in the middle, whereas damselfly eyes are found sort of on the side of the head, a bit like a hammerhead shark. Um, when, when, when they're at rest, dragonflies hold their wings out to the side, as you can see in the picture on the left here, whereas damselflies will have their wings 
and folded up over the back of the abdomen. And just looking how the, at the way they fly as well, um, dragonflies are are strong, strong flyers, fast flyers. As we heard, they can fly up to 30 miles an hour, whereas damselflies have a much weaker uh, and more fluttery flight. And when it comes to, to telling the difference between various species of dragonflies, looking, what I find most useful is, what if we look at in, dragonflies, they're insects, they've got a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. And there's a few things that help to, help to identify the, the similar species. So, First of all, looking at the, the colours of the eyes um, and then on the thorax, the middle bit, looking at the the, the stripes on the back of the, the call them the, the shoulder stripes or the antihumeral stripes and on the side of the thorax as well. And then on the uh, the, the leading edge of the, uh, the the wings is called the costa. Some species have have um, bright, brightly coloured costa and other peoples have quite dull colour, other species I should say quite dull colored costa and um, the abdomen is split up into 10 different segments and i'll oh, just move this out of the way i don't know if you see this or not 10 different segments um and quite often the colors at the top of the abdomen and towards the end of the abdomen or the, the or the where the, the spots or stripes for example um, are one way to tell difference between like this is a southern hawker which looks initially quite similar to a common hawker. And one of the ways to tell the difference is that the southern hawkers sort of has stripes at the end of the abdomen, whereas the common hawker has spots going all the way down. And then they have these anal appendages at the end of the abdomen. Nice. And that's what they use to, to hold on to the female when they're mating. Um, and over here we have the, the damselfly. Um so again, head, thorax, abdomen, and again, it's looking at the the shoulder stripes, the 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 color of the 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 stripes on the side of the thorax, markings at the top of the abdomen, usually on segment two. Remember when I talked about the northern damselfly, I talked about the the ace of spades mark. Um, this is an azure uh, damselfly, and it has sort of like I call it a Honda a Honda logo. I find that's quite an easy way to remember it, but an almost sort of shape. Uh, H shape there. Um, and again, segment eight, segment nine, segment ten, there's quite often distinctive colours and shapes down that down there. Um, and dragonflies are found in all sorts of wet habitats. So one of the, one of the first habitats is is ponds. And some of you'll have um Ponds in your gardens, you'll have uh, damselflies probably in your, your garden ponds, maybe as your damselflies and large red damselflies. Um, so this looks like a garden pond on the right hand side here. We've got lots of emergent vegetation, which is great for when the, the dragonfly, the, the nymph are ready to emerge as an adult. We've got um, sort of oxygenating vegetation in the water. There's... Um, vegetation on the top of the water so there's cool areas in the pond as well as sunny sunny open areas in this pond here which is obviously a bit bigger we have trees for shelter which is great again there's um areas round about here where they'll be able to hunt uh, lots of grass uh, wildflowers and so on um so that's a perfect habitat for dragonflies top tips for finding dragonflies it's a real hardship Pick a sunny day, head out between head out in the summer, the spring of the summer, autumn, midday onwards, um, and sit still and relax by the water's edge. And um, you're almost guaranteed to see dragonflies if it's a sunny day and there's dragonflies in that water body. Rivers and canals, we don't have so many of them. Um, so many species using uh running water in Scotland, but uh the la the golden ring dragonfly is uh, it's found in fairly fast flowing burns, fairly high altitudes as well. Um, I call it the, the hillwalker's dragonfly. And that's the species that can take up to six years to, to complete its life cycle because it's quite cold in its habitat. The food availability is quite low, so it takes that bit longer um, to, to develop. If we're looking at the south of England, there'll be uh, it's that much warmer that some damselflies can complete their life cycle in a year. 
compared to ours taking two years. And if we look at the south of France, for example, there'll maybe be three generations of that species of damselfly in one year. So it all depends on temperature, food availability, how fast the um the, the life cycle is. And these are these are more typical Scottish habitats, uplands and acidic bog pools. As I was saying, quite a lot of our rare species are found in acidic bog pools, and I will be talking about them quite a lot um, in the, the rest of the talk. So just a bit about dragonfly hotspots. When I first first started working for the BDS in 2013, my um my first job was to set up dragonfly hotspots across Scotland. And what's a dragonfly hotspot? It's basically a place where you can easily see dragonflies. Um, it's easily accessible for people to get around. And there's people who will be able to come to connect with dragonflies, learn about dragonflies. And we've used these uh, hotspots as places for training and um, for various events and so on. And we've got 10 um, not particularly well distributed across the country because basically the funding that we got from um, SNH at the time wanted us to concentrate in the, the central belt and uh, sort of up towards Aberdeen as well. So it varies from, we have our hotspots from um, Aberdeen in the north down to Carlaverock in Dumfries and Galloway in the south. And the ones that are closest to us here in, in Stirling will be um, Flanders Moss, um, Argety, Red Kites and Davila Forest. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them. So this is Flanders Moss, um, not that far, about seven miles outside Stirling, just down the hill from Thornhill. Uh, it's been a dragonfly hotspot for about 10, eight, 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 10 years, I would say. Right, it's going to do this thing of moving forward by itself. So I'm going to try and stop that. Um, so I don't know if I'll manage to do this. I'm just going to stop sharing for a second and go and change the no it's not working i can't get out of it for some reason uh, danielle just just why you've stopped we're getting a um gray bar again across All the right. top and I noticed when you were showing us the, the different features of the dragon and damselflies, there was a bit where you said, oh, I don't know if you'll see this, I'll just move this out the road. Uh -huh. uh, I don't know if it's maybe you've got a text box or something. Yes. That seems to correlate to the grey box. Uh, right, okay. Uh, so I think that's that's appearing to us as a blacked out grey box. So that that I think that's what it is. Okay, right. Well, I'm sorry about that. I've got no idea how to fix it, <laughs> of course. <laughs> No problem. It, it does seem to move when you move it, though. So right. uh, okay. yeah. Well, if it needs if it needs to be moved, then then let me know if it's if it's a bit of a pain. Um. All right, from current slide. Okay, I think I fixed this. So um, hopefully it's gonna work. Right. Can you see that? Yes. Great. Okay. So Flanders Moss. It's just outside Stirling. Um, it's one of the biggest raised bogs um, in the cent in the central area of Scotland. That's Ben Lomond that you can see um, in the distance there, and it's owned and it's managed by Nature Scott, and they've been car been carrying out quite a lot of um, peatland restoration recently. And it's also one of the best places in this area, I would say, to see um, lizards. So lizards will be sunbathing right, left, and centre on on the boardwalk. Um, if you're very lucky on a sunny day. They do eat the dragonflies. Um, quite often you'll see one munching on a black darter, especially towards the end of the end of the summer. And I think this is a female who's got lots and lots of eggs inside her there. Um, I think she's quite close to... I think lizards actually give birth to live young, don't they? So I think she's going to... Um, she's going to have some babies very soon. Um, at, like all our hotspots, we've used... Um, We've carried out lots of training events. It's a great place for seeing common hawkers and black darters. Um, and I think even on this wet and windy day here, we managed to see a few uh, common hawkers emerging on the, the rushes. And this is an exuvia on the right-hand side here. So an exuvia is basically the, the skin that's left behind once the adults emerged. And it's definitive evidence of breeding. So 
Um, it's great to find an exuvia. You know that it's gone through its whole life cycle. It, it, the dragonfly has gone through its whole life cycle at that location. <clears throat> and we've carried out a number of um, sort of practical volunteer days. One year we we put in some little peatland pools, dug out some some pools and dammed some um, some small areas of water uh, to make new dragonfly habitat and uh, seeded them with some sphagnum. And they've done quite well. I think black darters breeded in them, breeded, bred in them the following uh, the following summer. So they've been colonised quite quite quickly. And there's a picture of one quite just after we'd we dug it out. So we basically put in some peat dams, um, to keep the water there. And just about every year we do have a, a volunteer day pulling out the vegetation, um, from. A couple of sites just to try and keep the the water clear as the, the vegetation does seem to grow um faster these days i don't know if it's due to warmer temperatures with climate change but um water vegetation just seems to to, to grow rampant so most years we'll have a, a volunteer day where um, everybody can get wet and muddy and uh, we'll use that vegetation to sort of prop up the dam just further down um closer to the boardwalk to make sure that the water stays on the bog there. <clears throat> the Villa Forest um, is uh, it's a, a site owned and managed by FLS, Forestry and Land Scotland. It's just to the east of Kincardine. Um, so it's just off the road between Kincardine and Dunfermline. It's a wonderful site for seeing, again, um, it's quite an, it must have quite acidic water. It's great for seeing common hawkers and black darters. So there's... Um, Red squirrels as well, great great site for red squirrels. It's mostly a Scots pine plantation and there's a couple of water bodies. So this picture here shows Bordy Loch, which is where it's great to see the damselflies and the black darters and the, the common hawkers. Um, great for pond dipping as well. There's nice easy bits to get into. So you can do some, some larval ID there. So this is uh, where we had a um, an ID training course not a few years ago. And there was a, a section by the boardwalk where um it, it was drying out during the summer and it wasn't it was initially a good site for damselflies. So we tried to um deepen this this area by digging digging out some of the vegetation and putting in some plastic piling to keep the, the water there. However, it wasn't very successful. And when I was back there in the summer, um there's no water at all left in that area. Um, so we've we've sort of moved away. It really needs it really needs the work of a digger. So we've moved away and um, we've carried out a few volunteer days at uh, Keir Dam, which, as you can see from the picture here, <laughs> there's not much open water left there either. So rather, again, it needs it needs a digger to to get in there and remove the vegetation. So we just worked on um, creating little pockets, little pockets of. Uh, water in amongst it. It was mostly horse horse tail, I think. So we we've we've done this over the over a number of years. We did one uh, had a volunteer day there last year. But yes, if you're looking for things to do, Stuart, um, there's plenty plenty of work to do there. Um, and this is where I saw my first ever southern hawker uh, dragonfly, and she was trying to lay her eggs in the wood of that boardwalk that you saw a couple of um, photos ago. And um, so this is a, a little video I took of a, a southern female southern hawker laying her eggs. So the um, female dragonflies, they have something called an ovipositor, which is like a, a blade shaped object that they lay their eggs through, but they cut a hole. They can just see it there. You can see something sort of almost sickle shape just coming out there. Um, and so she's using that to cut holes in the vegetation and then lay eggs through the ovipositor into that 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 cut in the vegetation. Um, so that was quite an quite a nice quite a nice thing to see. And um, so it's a good site for seeing for seeing southern hawkers as well as um, common hawkers and black darters. Um, and there's lots of really nice way marked paths around about. Um, Devilla. It's bad for dog fouling though. So if dog fouling gets you annoyed, don't go, don't go to Devilla. So the, the, the next, um, and this is our, our newest um dragonfly hotspot, is at Argety Red Kites, which is just outside Dune. 
And as you would expect, Argety Red Kites does have a, a wonderful kite feeding station. So there's a number of red kites that, that breed round about. But this time of the year, as um, natural food is becoming scarce, um, there, I was there maybe a month ago, um, and there must have been 40 kites there at feeding time. It was, it was an absolutely amazing spectacle. Well worth going to see the kites. They also have red squirrels. And they also have wonderful dragonflies. So this is our uh, dragon. This is the dragonfly pond here. So this is very close to the reception. And they do a number of like, pond dipping events and so on here. Um, and they have had Southern Hawker here as well. Um, and they have a number of other lovely uh, natural ponds throughout the throughout the site. It is a working farm. And they have recently got um, a number of beaver families that have been relocated from areas in um, Perthshire where the landowners <clears throat> didn't want them. So they've been run being killed. Thankfully, they were trapped and relocated to Argety. So as well as seeing um, kites, squirrels, dragonflies, you've got the chance of seeing beavers as well. So well worth, well worth a visit. And I'm going to move this down here. So I'm moving down that bar and maybe removing the, the uh, grey box as well. So just a request for, for you to help us fill in the gaps um, because we, we do have lots of dragonfly records. Of course we do. We've got wonderful volunteers who's, who uh, reliably send in lots and lots of um, records every year. And that information is very valuable, as you'll know. Um, but we do still have quite a lot of gaps of uh, on the maps where we would expect to find um, various species. Um, and so I'm appealing to, to people to help us fill in those gaps. So what I've got here is, this is a, a southern hawker on the right-hand side here. Um, on the map on the left, that's from um, NBN. And this is the southern hawker distribution that we have in Scotland. So... Um, <laughs> The Southern Hawker distribution has always bemused me to a certain extent because there's, there's been a good population around about Inverness and that's definitely spreading out in the last few years. There's always been a good population in Arg Argyle, which is spreading out now. And then we now have this population here sort of in the central belt that's come up um, from down south and they're moving, uh, moving north. So quite an interesting quite an interesting distribution of a species not one that you would really um imagine to be like that so this is a, a closer um a closer map so you can see the range from that'll be Davila just there um so from Kinross to Ochterarda to west of Dunblane that'll be um Dune Ponds I think um so yes down to Bonnie Bridge down to Falkirk um so if you're really if you're keen to get into your dragonfly recording, then um, Pat, who who's the country recorder for for BDS in Scotland, and um, you can get a spreadsheet from Pat, or you could put them into the iRecord app if you like to 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 do things on your phone as you go along, or you could put them into iRecord online via the the BDS website. So I'm sure you'll all know this information. What what information do we need? Uh, basically, who you are. What have you seen? Where did you see it? When did you see it? And if you can get a photo, then that'll be useful, um, especially for, for species that can be quite easily confused with others. And also be handy to, to note the habitat, you know, what vegetation is there, um, how deep's the water, the size of the pond, tree cover, that kind of thing. And that's just the, the iRecord app on your, your phone. Um, I'm sure quite a few of you use it. And it is it's a it's a nice easy way to record when you're sort of out and about, and then that's the the address for um, putting your information in online on the BDS website. And then your records they'll basically be they'll be checked by Pat, and then they'll go into the the network database, and then onto MBN, the Atlas of Living Scotland, so everybody can use them. And then I've used them over the years to to find where the rare species are. Um, establish key sites, sort of work with landowners to, to produce a, a conservation action or manage the habitat, and also to, to make those hotspots as well. And then also used for producing the Dragonfly Atlas. The most recent one was in 20, 
2014 um, and the Strait of Dragonflies report, which was produced in 2020. And so I'm moving on to our conservation partnerships from last year. Uh, last year was quite an exciting year. We seemed to get things all seemed to come together conservation wise. And also it was our 40th birthday. In fact, I think it's in that logo there, which you can't see. There we go. 40 years. So that was last year. BDS has been around for 40 years. So starting off with Azure Hawker, this is uh, Pat, who is a, a, an amazing woman. Um, so as I said, she's the, the, the recorder for the whole of Scotland. And this is Sarah Watts, who's the conservation manager at Carrower Estate. And I'll be talking quite a lot about Carrower. Um, it really doesn't want to move on to the next stride. Right, we're, there we go. So we have a number of red data book species in the country. Um, endangered are northern damselfly and white-faced darter. Vulnerable are azure hawker and brilliant emerald. And we've recommended that azure hawkers moved up a band to endangered basically due to um, uh, climate change. Variable damselfly is near threatened along with northern emerald. And again, we've recommended that that's moved up a band to vulnerable. And again, because of climate change, because they're bog pool species. <clears throat> so we're going to um, go to Carrara Estate. I don't know if any of you know Carrara Estate. It's only accessible by um, train, unless you want to walk or cycle or ride. In um, it's This is um, Rannick Station where I get on. Um, which even has information about peat bog. I think it must be the nicest uh, station in the whole of Scotland. Certainly the nicest one I've ever visited. Um, and then uh, uh, we've been working with uh, Carawa for probably about eight years now. But surveys uh, that we've been carried out for Azure Hawker and other rare peatland species in the Highlands over the past few years, we found that so much of the habitat has been um has been drying out um you might have seen this yourself we've had like no larvae or any other invertebrates surviving in these uh, in these dried up pools so to combat this um at Carrower, we worked with sarah sarah who's the the conservation officer um, to come up with some new pool designs. Um, so these were of different sizes, depths and shapes that we hoped would hold water in times of drought. And on meeting the contractor uh, last February, we looked at the two areas where we plan to work and how the lie of the land could best be used to our advantage. So one area is quite close to the station. Um, I don't know if we can see the station. You can just see the station in the background here, I think. There we go. That's the station there. Um, and the other is about a mile away down the old track back towards Rannick Station. And this is the drowned kitten sphagnum, sphagnum cuspidatum that's found in the pools that Azure hawkers prefer. So, and Pat's using, you can see she's using the high-tech colander method of carrying out larval surveys there. And here is Sarah, and uh, one of the pools is being deepened. Um, this took place in March. We created seven new pools or dammed, dammed um, existing pools to raise the water level at the station complex. And um, we've produced eight newer dammed pools at the, the two com complexes at Lubna Clach. Uh, the digger driver was absolutely brilliant, really, really um talented and i have a a little video here which sort of captures our joy at how well um it had gone uh so just it's it's very windy um but there are subtitles so you should be able to understand what's going on
So we're, we're, we're very happy, aren't we? Yes, yes, because we were getting very concerned because some of the pools here that um, two years ago had a lot of azure hawker larvae and when we came back after the drought then there was hardly any azure hawker larvae at all. It went from 231 down to about 11 larvae in total in the whole area. So we were um, thinking that um, the, the pools were suffering and quite a few of the pools that had dried up had got when the, they were refilled with water had a hard layer and they had become it, they didn't look very suitable as though they the, the azure hawker <coughs> wouldn't like those pools in fact that we couldn't find larvae of, of anything in them the ones that had dried up so there must have been uh, quite a big death rate and now we've got some pools that have got deeper areas that hopefully if they if they do dry parts of them dry then there'll be some deeper refuges yeah. for, for and invertebrates to go into yeah place. and it's just amazing as, as you said earlier on Sarah how in the space of 24 hours how much water there is in there already and how natural they look already there's no exposed peat um you know it's just it's everything we could have we yeah. could have hoped yeah. for yeah and so we're just gonna have to make sure that we keep on top of monitoring it and make sure which pools the the as your hawkers seem to prefer and we can use that management in the future for working with other landowners. So it's great to have done that groundbreaking work here at Karaiwa. The Pat carried out some surveys of um, the new pools in May um, and she found nine larvae in six out of 12 of the new pools. And then a number of us returned in September for more surveys and we were excited to find or to have positive results. Um, so the deeper pools did retain water when the shallow pools dried out, as as we would have hoped. Um, and we found 14 azure hawker larvae in seven out of the 12 new pools. And um, most of them were quite large larvae with well-developed wing buds, um, which means that they, they'll be emerging um, in probably in May next year. And this is the most large larvae that have been found anywhere uh, recently um, and most were in the pools that had been deepened um, to enable the water retention and where sphagnum had been carefully transferred so that's quite interesting it's likely that the eggs of the larvae would have been transferred in that sphagnum and two were in a new small pool and we think that they probably traveled overland from other pools that were were relatively close by that were drying out, but we don't we don't really know. Uh, we think we think they can do that. We think the larvae can do that, but we kind of need more research to to come to some sort of conclusion. So the results from this year's surveys were very promising, um, and we plan to create more pools at Karawa uh, in the future. So we'll be continuing to monitor um, their colonisation, so we can use this information when advising other um, landowners. And what we have next is a very windy, a very windy video again, I'm afraid. Um, so it's just a bit about just looking at the larvae, how to identify them. We were measuring them um, basically for the for the study. For 36. So we have a, an, an azure hawker here now. Pat's measuring it at how big, Pat? 36 millimetres. 36 millimetres. It's a mature one that will now overwinter and hopefully survive to hatch early in the spring. And shall we have a quick look at the mask? Oh. <laughs> Which is long and narrow and tapers right in. Much less rectangular sheet yes. um, with very common look. Thanks, we love. And this is a, a common hawker. I don't know if you'll be able to tell the difference, but um, just the the mask, which is the sort of what they use to catch their food. It's the the. A bit underneath the head, it's a much more rectangular shape, and they're much more chunky, chunky animals than the azure hawker. <laughs> this common hawker is 40 millimetres long. Yeah. Um, 
meters long. So with, as well as uh, Prairie being a one, wonderful site for um, Azure Hawker, it's also we found a new population of white-faced darters and white-faced darters um, are sort of top of the top of the red list. Um, and so, which is now named the white-faced the white -faced darter pool. Um, and here's a lovely Azure Hawker adult taken by our new area coordinator in the, the Northwest, Graham Rennie. Um, despite looking, as I was saying, for, for these dragonflies for 10 years, um, still to get a good view of an adult. They can be very elusive. Um, so we've got a new key site at Kinloch Woodlands near Shieldig in the Northwest Highlands. It's a, a SCIO, a Scottish Charitable Incorporated Organisation, um, managed for the community. Um, and it's one of the best views, I would say, in the country. Look at that picture on the right, absolutely beautiful. Plus it has a number of rare species. Um, it has a white-faced darter, northern emerald, azure hawker, and keeled skimmer on the site. It's quite a good, it's big, big site, thousand acres, next to Ben Shieldig key site, which is owned by the Woodland Trust. So it's good to have that sort of continuity of area, managed for dragonflies, has some Caledonian pine, ancient Caledonian pine forest on it, and the majority of it is peatland. And we can see these pictures here. That's a keeled skimmer at the top. Um, and I saw my first ever keeled skimmer there this year. That was wonderful. Um, and that's an azure poker larva underneath. Um, so these photos were taken by Graham, who's been doing a lot of work there over the, the past few years. And in June, I carried out, uh, I organised a day's training with um, Graham, and it was attended by the site managers, um, various local conservation staff and volunteers. And as you can see, it was an absolutely beautiful day. Um, and this is a white-faced darter larva on the left-hand side. Nice and easy to identify because it's got three black stripes going down their underside. So there's a number of bog pools on the site. Uh, this one on the left here was the best location for a white-faced darter. But sadly, like so many other shallow pools, many are drying out. So I'm I'm working on a management plan just now to see how we can improve some of the pools for dragonflies and prevent them drying out in the future. Um, it may be possible to create some peak buns or dams like we did at Carrow and raise the, the water level. <clears throat> Here's some more of Graham's lovely pictures of Azure Hawker. As I know, you know they, they are such beautiful creatures and so many people are keen to see them, well, especially me. Um, and um, Pat and I have been working with FLS this year to, to train their environmental teams in each area on rare dragonfly ID and, and advising on habitat management. Um, FLS sites are very important for dragonflies, as we can see from this map here. They own and manage over 50 sites which have rare species, including Glen Affric, which is one of the best sites in the UK for rare species. Um, so there's huge potential for lots of positive work. Um, we signed uh, a, a, an agreement with FLS last year, um, so this is really quite exciting for us. Um, they've committed to include work for dragonflies in their, in their delivery programmes. So as I said, we focused on training and um, habitat management advice this year. So I'm going to show you some pictures of surveys and training with the staff. This is Tony and Bill on the left hand side. They're based near uh, Lockerbie in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, and they've been doing a fantastic job of putting in new networks of ponds wherever they can and creating wonderful new homes for dragonflies and other wildlife, creating real sort of habitat connectivity. And in fact, uh, they sent Bill sent me some pictures just before Christmas and they just created a whole new wonderful wetland or not created, but improved um, a wonderful new wetland. Um, and yeah, they're just, it's amazing what they've been doing there. And we took the North team out to see Northern Davis fly habitat in the Cairngorms recently. Um, and there's huge potential for new Northern Davis fly ponds in uh, FLS forests to help the population expand further. We visited a few of the ponds that have been put in as part of um, a recent project that we worked with the Cairngorms National Park on, putting in um, sort of new northern damselfly ponds, uh, stepping stones between existing habitat and managing existing 
um, sites as well that were beginning to vegetate over. And it was a similar picture for the East team. Uh, a new Northern Damsfly site had been found at Fetteresso near Stonehaven, so quite a distance from the nearest site in D side. So again, there's the possibility of connecting these sites. So we have Northern da da Damselfly. This is the Ballater Curling Pond here. And um, we have Northern Damselflies here. We have Northern Damselflies here, here, here. And the, the new site was just down here to the southeast. And all this land in between is FLS forest. So um, so by connecting these sites, um, if they dig new ponds within the forest and create more stepping stone ponds for the dragonflies to move along, it's quite exciting to think about what can be done. And in the Galloway Hills, not far from Silver Flows, as the crow flies, um, I did some training with uh, the staff there. And it's as your hoka were found at Silver Flows until about five years ago. So, uh, as I said, they are quite elusive dragonflies. They may still be there. It's just that nobody's found them. The chances are that with climate change it's maybe just too warm for them now and just they just haven't managed to survive um <clears throat> but uh the uh, the staff have been very keen and it's been really encouraging to to work with them across uh, across the whole of scotland this is the sterling team they have northern emerald sites which again were vegetating over um and uh, there's a nice picture of a Northern Emerald pair on the right hand side here, which is taken by David McCulloch. Flanders Moss is quite an exciting site for Northern Emerald because it's the most southerly site that we know of where Northern Emeralds are found. And most of them are found on the west side of the um of the reserve. But after the peatland restoration has been carried out over the past few years, more of them have been found on the east side of um of the reserve. So you might be lucky enough to see them from the boardwalk. So what do we have going for the future? I'm just running through this because I think I'm probably uh, over overshooting my time somewhat. Um, in 2024, we're going to be working again with the Gorms National Park on northern damselfly ponds um, by extending the habitat connectivity within the park. We'll be putting in new ponds and managing, again, existing ponds that aren't in particularly good condition. Plus, we're going to be working outside the park, so there's potential to include sites in Northern Perthshire and West Aberdeenshire as well, which is really quite exciting. And this is uh, one of Stephen Corcoran's maps. Um, <clears throat> the uh, existing sites for Northern Damselfly, so this is in Strathspey, so we have, um, there's Carbridge there, Aviemore there. So Northern Damselfly are present at these orange sites, and then... Um, so he's suggested new pond locations in blue, so to improve the connectivity between um between the sites. And so that'll be especially um important up this glen, up this glen here. And next year, um, or this year, <laughs> yeah, this year actually, um, so we've got an NRF funding application in to carry out landscape scale conservation for work for dragonflies on the bog. So that would be doing a similar thing that we've been doing at Carower but extending it on a much bigger scale across a, a number of different estates. So we're still waiting to hear that. And I'll just finish off with this little video of a Northern Emerald, which has just emerged from its little bog pool. And oh, just, well, only a few months to go until we see them and hear, hear the willow warblers as well. Um, and yes, it's quite exciting because we have a new job um that's just been posted today uh, a full-time conservation officer um in scotland who would be doing um a lot of overseeing of contractors if we get the nrf funding um and lots of other exciting exciting um jobs similar to what i've been talking about today so if anybody's interested in that um i've put it on the uh, Twitter page. Um, so go and, go and have a look. So thank you very much for listening to me. Sorry about rushing through at the end there, but I do think I've um, gone over my time somewhat. It's quarter to, quarter to nine. Um, all right, so I'll stop sharing and take, take your questions. Thank you, Danielle. That, that was amazing. And don't worry about time. We never have a formal sort of end time anyway. Uh, and that was just 
absolute amazing content. So it was well well worth it. I think I think I think what really shows shows me is in the later half theory your talk. Um, yeah, I think you know you agree the, the the British Dragonfly Society has not got a huge presence in Scotland. Um, but wow, look at all the work that these are getting done, and the fact you've got a new project officer coming as well. Wow, what yeah. we're going to see in the future—that's yeah. that, that's absolutely amazing. Um, it's quite an I, exciting time, it is. Yeah, it certainly sounds it, and it's, a, it's <laughs> amazing to see what um, what, what projects you've been doing and a lot of really crucial things there. I've certainly noticed a lot of bogs having having that same problem. They're drying out, and yeah, the, the dragonfly and damselflies have largely vanished from the bogs. Yeah. Plus, of course, all the other aquatic insects that are there as well. So, um, it's great to see some you know some things being trialed that we, that can be taken forward to other places and tried yeah. out. Um, that's absolutely fantastic. Amazing videos in there. Uh, I had loved loved the one with the. The, the seed shooting and see, seeing it, it, it just how quickly it picked that up. I mean, you can barely see it in slow motion when you're a human. I and it, it, it just see that they just oh, there we are, there it goes. Um, that's that's amazing. One thing I picked up in your talk, I think I heard you say, and I just want to check because it sounds so amazing. Golden ring can take six years um to mature into an apple. Yeah. That's yeah. absolutely amazing. I think. Yeah. I think we all forget with a lot of these things with butterflies, with dragonflies, with other insects. You know, we see them as the adult and we think, oh, they're all so short lived, you know, because we just say, but that we are just seeing the very end of what, what's been going on. But six years, that's absolutely amazing. I know, because um, yeah, you think about dragonflies as these beautiful jeweled creatures flying around on a on a warm sunny day but yet they just live as a few weeks as as an adult so the majority of their life is underwater as a as a larva larva or a nymph yeah but in six years it's 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 amazing isn't it that's that's amazing I me mean, that that's what 2018 then <laughs> some of them were right. before well that's it was. yeah wow uh what what an amount of time um so We've got quite quite a few questions that I'll try and get as many in as I can. Okay. One, one of the ones that got a wee bit on the chat, and I have to say this, has always been one of my personal fascinations with them. Um, and I think a number of examples came up at the top that you were saying about the new, uh, I think it was at Castle Fraser, the new um, Northern Damselfly uh, site yeah. that dug in. You know, the year later they'd colonised it and various folk were then saying in the chat, well, you know, I put a pond in and two days later there they were. So how, how do they do that? How to, I know one of our local reserves, Western Moss Reserve, if anybody looks down, fantastic peatland site. It's a peatland work done, and literally a few few weeks later, it was full of all sorts of dragon and dubs fly species. Oh, and they just found it, and it's like, how did that happen? So how, how do they do that? How how do they suddenly find these new opportunities so efficiently? Well, they, 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 can, fl they can fly a decent distance. I mean, we don't have any migratory species here, but... Um, they're, when they're flying around, they're attracted by polarized light. So that's obviously the the light that reflects off off water. Though it will also reflect off plastic and off roads, which isn't very good for dragonflies. Um, but yeah, so they they're attracted to that polarized light. They can tell that there's water there, so they'll come down. They'll come down and have a look. So yes, it it can take them no time if they're in the area. Obviously, they need they need to be uh fairly close roundabout. Um. Then yes, they can find them in as 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 we've seen in the chat. They can find them in a, a the case of a matter of hours uh, or days. Yeah, so that's it's fantastic. It's one of the most encouraging thing about putting in a wildlife pond in your garden, isn't it? To see how quickly the wildlife the wildlife arrives. I think it's absolutely. I guess in these ponds with the light reflect must be like beacons shining out yeah. to them. That, and it's amazing. Their eyes are. I mean, we've seen how well they from your videos there how they can track prey and everything. But the fact they can see that as well, what amazing eyes that they have. Mm. Um, you yeah, actually touched there with a few other <laughs> questions, and it's how if we do put a wildlife pond into our garden. How can we best encourage them to come in? And I think there was also a wee bit of a question about what's the sort of minimum size that's viable for them as well? Well, um, we have a wonderful digger pond for dragonflies leaflet on the website. So I would say, so British dragonflies, british-dragonflies.org.uk and then go to, I think it's under resources, or oh, there's a, a gardening for wildlife section, excuse me, 
Um, <clears throat> and it is a really, really good leaflet. It has all the, the the dimensions and which plants you should put in at different areas and so on. But I would say that you're going to be constricted to a certain extent by sort of like the the layout of your garden. But the bigger, the better. Um, I've moved recently and I haven't got a pond in, in yet, but I have a, a water plant storage container, which is about a metre and a half by 80 centimetres. And, and I have large red, drangs, large red damselflies in that. Um, at my, my The pond at my last house was... It was probably three meters by two meters, and then yeah, the, I had damselflies in there. Um, certainly the the following year from when I when I put it in, um, breeding. So I mean, even a a, a tub pond is good. Um, you might not get damselflies in there, but you'll have birds coming to use it, and you know a water feature is lovely. You just sit you sit by it on a on a sunny day and just watch what's going on in the in the um in the water and I, th I think you know there's nothing better for your for for well-being than sitting by a pond and looking in the bigger the better i would say but it i think a two two and a half meter by one and a half meter pond you'd get damselflies in there but I, do have a look at that digger pond for dragonflies it's very good oh it de definitely i think i saw that recently so dig dig a pond for dragonflies, dragonflies. so have a look in the british dragonfly website folks uh to see that um and it's really surprising how how small a pond they come in and, and i guess even if you have one of these really small top ponds but if you have a nice wildlife friendly garden i guess yeah. you might even just help species to move about they might just come in feed up a bit and then let them move on even if they can't breed there i guess as well well de definitely because it's all about habitat connectivity now isn't it i mean our if we put to, if if in the whole of the UK we put all our gardens together, it would cover more of an area than all our nature reserves, um, far more of an area. So, well, if you can garden for wildlife, um, have you know sort of like wild plants, have some nice hedging, have plants that are in flower pretty much throughout the whole year, have your water body, um, then yeah, it can make a huge difference if you garden for wildlife. And as you say, they might it might work as a set, stepping stone for them to feed in and then find a, a better, a bigger pond elsewhere. Um, but anything you can do to garden for wildlife is going to be a bonus for obviously a lot of wildlife, but also for dragonflies because those insects are what the dragonflies will feed on. And I guess now they are they are quite a good indicator uh, if you start seeing on a site because they must have so much pre items and everything about that you know if you're doing the right stuff for them and they're coming in you must be doing right for quite a lot of other things by by you're at it as well. Yeah, well that's it. So they yeah they're they're almost like apex apex insect predators I suppose. So their presence is going to show that you've got quite a healthy um ecosystem in your garden but also they're great clean water indicators as well so they're quite useful for science in that respect you know they're only found in um in water bodies that are quite clean so um if you've got them in your pond you know that you know your, your pond's quite a nice a nice clean pond fantastic the, another question which I, i've kind of wondered actually is somebody's asked is is there any way you can identify individuals by just looking at them? Is there any wee changes in the markings or anything like that? Or is, is that very difficult uh, to do? I would, or, say, I would say it's very, it's very difficult because they're so fast. They look so similar. I mean, it, it could be possible. And I'm sure there's probably mark recapture um, uh, studies that have, that have gone on. And where people have got to know what their dragonflies look like. But I think for, you know, the, the average person on the street who's trying to identify their... The damselflies might be a bit easier if they're spending quite a lot of time roosting. But I think it's a, I think that's going to be a tricky, <laughs> a tricky thing to do. They, they, do, they do just pass. I think I've once heard of somebody say, I've, again, I think it was a, a damselfly, they reckoned they could tell they had the same one because it, it seemed to have a tear in the wing. Right. Uh, place, so it seemed to have marked itself. Yeah. Uh, for them. And, oh, a clever damselfly. <laughs> but that's it. Let, let them know you've got the same one in the garden. Uh, and that, that was a question somebody asked as well, is about how how solid are their wings? I mean, how, um, I, I think they're kind of, you know, thinking about butterfly wings and obviously very delicate and everything. Yeah. Are, 
their wings as delicate as that? Or what, what well, are their wings like? They they I think they're stronger they're stronger than they look. They have a, a sort of flexible protein in them and the the venation the, the venation in the wings causes them it, it gives them quite a lot of strength. And also they, they have these um pterostigma or the 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 sort of wing spots at the, the end of each wing that helps to strengthen them as well. However, they are, you know, for a creature of our size trying to catch a dragonfly it, with our hands, for example, the chances are we would uh, sort of break their break their wings or hurt or damage their wings. So I think, yeah, they're stronger than we think they are, but they're still fairly delicate on, on our scale. So we do have to be very careful if we're trying to catch them in a, a butterfly net, for example, just make sure that you catch them in the, the netty bit and don't hit them with the hard bit. So I think I've got one one more main question. I've got kind of another wee one as well that's sitting, but the next one, where did I write it? I'm trying to remember. Ah, climate climate change, of course. That that would be the the one. So you 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 already showed quite a, how there's quite a lot of species actually coming into Scotland. And the question was really is there well in fact it was two questions that I've sort of combined. Um and it was is there more that we're likely to see? Is there others poised on the border and they're coming our way? Another question was, are we losing some? Are some trending up, upwards up higher places and yeah. they're running at a hillside to run to? Are we going to lose some possibly? Um, are we going to gain some? What, yeah. What's going well, to go it, on? It's definitely a double-edged sword. It's quite exciting, the ones that are coming up from the south. So, like I said, the broad-bodied chaser, um, the... Um, we're certainly getting more, far more um, banded demoiselles are being found throughout Scotland, which are sort of like the ultimate in insect perfection. I would say the banded demoiselle. I didn't have any pictures in their demoiselles, which is a bit of a shame. Um, the migrant hawkers, uh, the it's just 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 about everything is just sort of shifting further north gradually, um, even. Uh, uh, Norfolk hawkers, which are originally were only found in Norfolk, are now I think they're as far north as um, Lancashire, maybe. So, so yes, yeah, so, so southern species are definitely moving in. They're going to have an impact on our existing species. Of course, they're going to be competing for um, the same habitat. It's going to be competing for for food, and then the terrifying. Well, terrifying for me because I, I I've seen it for the past few years is those bog pools that are drying out, um, you know, nothing surviving in them because of our 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 hot springs, uh, hot summers. Um, what's going to happen to those bog pool species unless we do something on a huge scale to try and to try and help them? Um, you know, the the future just doesn't. It, it doesn't look like they've got much of a future at all. Um, because although, you know, with with the we're having those hot brief, those hot prolonged periods, but then we're having um, you know, more rain than we would normally, but it's happening in a very short period where, you know, the, the ground's not able to absorb it. And then these bog pools have formed this horrible hard crust and the water doesn't get doesn't get doesn't get in um so even when the water does come then when the rain does come then you know it's 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 not doing what we would hope it would hope it would do so climate change yes it's exciting quite exciting with the species that are coming in but on the other hand those species are definitely have an impact on our existing ones and and also you know the the species that live in shallow pools are going to be really really hard hit and they are being really really hard hit already you know climate change it's not something that's happening and drowning people in sort of bangladesh it's something that's happening and affecting um lots of people here as we've seen with all those recent floods sort of breaking um i was i'm cut off quite regularly with the flooding now um you know it's just something that you have to take into account and think well i have to get my shopping <laughs> i have to get my shopping on Monday, because we're going to have lots of rain on Tuesday and Wednesday, and it's likely that I'm going to be cut off again. And I guess for, for everybody watching, it probably feels like it's a massive thing, and what can we do about it? But, you know, it is all about 
if, if all of us can do small things to reduce our carbon footprint, induce our climate impact, anything we can do to help reverse it, even if it, you know, plant a tree in your garden, encourage yeah. somewhere in your local community to get some trees in, to do some other habitat work, because not only trees absorb carbon, uh, and do that. But I guess also from those things you've shown us tonight, you know, there is actions if we know damsel flying dragonfly sites to get in touch with yourself and others to raise awareness to any land managers we may know and stuff and point to some of that stuff that's on the website and say, ah, that there's something you can do here um, that can help make them a bit more climate resistant. So I guess that's something we can all do is carry that awareness you've given us from this evening and point that out to anybody we think it might help some of these uh, species. Um, so I've got a wee bit of homework for everybody to do. <laughs> they are giving out homework. Uh, and that is to have, definitely have a look at the British Dragonfly Society webpage. And I'm, on there, there's information about how to record dragonflies and damselflies. But also, I know he's run a lot of events and a lot of training events. So do go to them. See some of the larva ones. I know a lot of people comment in the chat about how amazing the larva and how different they look recommend going on to those I did in Azure Hawker one a few years back. Absolutely amazing. And actually they're not they're actually I think easier to tell apart as a larva than adults, uh, I think <laughs> the dragonflies. Yeah, well I, I would I would well certainly some of them are, yeah. Yeah. Um but so, we could maybe do we can maybe do a sort of like online larval ID. Well let me think about it and I'll get back to you. Oh, definitely. That sounds that sounds good. We'll definitely come back to that. Um, and I think as well, um, you know, you mentioned some of the great sites we've got locally. Please, folks, go and visit them. I know Flanders Moss. Have a look at the Nature Scott Events page, and you'll see that the reserve yeah. staff there do lots of things, including dragonfly and damselfly walks, and also lizard walks. So you can go and see oh, the wow. lizards as well. And that pond that you showed, Danielle, um, I, was, I was out with some of the reserve staff there doing a wee event, and it was covered, that pond you showed, with Azuvia all over the edge. Oh, uh, fantastic. Obviously, everything had just, it was mostly black darter that just uh -huh. died there, and there was cases everywhere, every bit oh, of vegetation was sticking up, there was a case next to it. Oh, so uh, as, as you go in, if anybody knows Flanders Moss, as you go in the left of the big observation tower, and that's quite something to go up if you've never been up it, as you go around to the left, there's a pond just as you come up and it's got a wee viewing area have a look there it's a really good place to see dragonfly and damselflies so there's that as well the other thing i was going to say to folks is do have a look at danielle's business website so persia wildlife because the i know you do some fantastic stuff in there for wildlife and wildlife conservation and run some fantastic yeah. events to give people some really good opportunities to see some really unusual wildlife and also quite <laughs> close up as well. So please, folks, have a look at that. There's some fantastic stuff on the web page um, there as well. And please do, if you can uh, help with any of uh, British Dragonfly Society's events and things as well, please do volunteer if you can and have a look at them. Now, I've got one little to a tangent question, <laughs> and it's about something else that I know Danielle does and I always like to raise awareness of. And it's toad ladders. Right. So Danielle, could you quickly tell us a little bit about what toad ladders are? Because okay. uh, this is a great thing, folks, and it's actually really important for amphibian <laughs> conservation. So I'll let Danielle say something quickly about these. Okay. Um, when I worked as a, a ranger for local authority um, not so many years ago, um, I noticed that lots of uh, amphibians were falling down these roadside gully pots. And... Uh, I find thousands of drowned amphibians down gully pots. So we, we and I did a three year study on this. I got quite a lot of data um, and certainly in my area, which is fairly rural, um, I think it was 68% of all gully pots checked had some kind of wildlife had fallen in. So unless unless they're encouraged out or prevented from falling in, then it's obviously not going to end, end well for those, those wildlife. So, um, there's uh, an organisation in the Netherlands called Ravon, and they did lots of lab tests with real live amphibians. They dropped them down drains and they came up with all sorts of different designs for ramps for them to climb out onto. And the best design um, that they came up with was a steel, um, a, just basically a bit of steel with some uh, membrane uh, covering it so that the amphibians were able to sort of grab onto it and climb out. So it, in the past few years, we've, we've run quite a few workshops with Trevor Rose from from Friends of Angus Herpetofauna. He makes the ladders, or he makes he makes the kits, and then we have um, volunteer days where 
people help us put these ladders together and then we go and put them out in the, the problem gully pots. And then they work really well. In fact, I had some put in the village where I live last year because <clears throat> I'd be out every day rescuing five or ten frogs or toads every year, every day, I should say. And um, I don't have don't have any of them falling in anymore. Um, uh, they they obviously as soon as they feel this thing that they can climb up, they manage to get up and and get out and then continue on their way. So obviously, um, just once they come out of hibernation, they're on their way to their um their sort of breeding ponds. That's one of the worst times that they fall in. But I also found that in the summer when it's hot. I find quite a lot of amphibians down the gully pots and I wonder if they're at that point of it's too hot and too dry for them. And if they can't get to their local pond, they just end up jumping into a gully pot. And then that's obviously, unless there's a ladder there, then um, they're not going to be able to get back out again. So these amphibian ladders are, are wonderful things, um, but they do cost £30 each. So they're quite expensive. <laughs> but where's the best place to have a look online for, for more information about that? Um, if you go on to go to onto the Friends of Angus Herpetofauna website, and I think Trevor's probably got quite a lot of stuff on there. But if you go on to, we've got a, a Tayside Amphibians and Reptile Group Facebook page as well. There'll be lots of photos and and things on there too. I, I really do encourage folks to have a look at this. I I knew nothing about this until a number of years back. I was walking beside Danielle going to start for a conference. And Danielle stopped and lifted up a drain cover and was halfway down the drain. And I was like, what she did? And pulled out this group of a couple of toads that had fallen down the drain. And they just can't get back out. So yeah. they're down the drain. They're stuck until they slowly die down there. And after that, I started looking. And I've been amazed at where I found. I, I took 300 out of one drain oh, at one wow. point. And luckily, I knew to watch and got them it's amazing the numbers and they're they're population killers really they get stuck yeah. go down so if you've got especially if you know you've got ponds and breeding territory for amphibians around where you live do keep an eye down the street drains i have a wee telescopic net now that i can stick down and pull, pull them up you'll be amazed at how many can be down yeah. there and then have a look at as the toad ladders that danielle's <laughs> saying about you can really save you're basically your local amphibian and reptile population, you can save them with such action. It's it's quite shocking how many you can find down the drains. Um, and especially when you get there too late and you find quite a lot of dead ones, it's, yeah. it's really shocking. It's probably one of the biggest killers for some of them in some areas. Yeah, so yeah, I'd say so. really um, encourage folk, have a look at that. If you weren't aware of it before, it, it's it's a huge thing and there's not a lot of awareness of it. So that's that's why I add it as a quick question. Anytime I get the opportunity, um, please do look at that, folks, because well, it's amazing. If, if, and, and also, if um, if you've got, if you've found sort of problem gully pots and if you've got a bit of a budget of money left over, um, could maybe have a, a, a workshop putting together some ladders and putting them in. Ah, it's, that that sounds also a good idea. So especially if folk know locally of ones yeah. in the Stirling area, Stirling Clacks, where there's a problem, do get in touch with the group and let us know. So I know I've now went over a little bit on the questions as well. So I'll now very quickly pass us back over to Liz uh, to wrap to wrap us up for the evening. Hello there. Uh, well, Danielle, that was just wonderful. What's uh, what was really interesting was a range of things that you covered. You know, you might think of dragonflies and damselflies. You know, types focused in quite quite narrow, but not really at all, which is very very interesting. Um, so I, you know, I'm just saying huge thanks from us all because it's been absolutely fascinating. And uh, if I was going to, uh, given that Stuart's highlighted a few things, I'll just highlight one. And that is what Danielle was saying, but please do record, please do record uh, dragonflies and damselflies that you see. Not that they're always easy to photograph, but you know, if you can get even a half decent photograph, that helps. I mean, you know, an expert can tell a lot from a fairly rubbish photograph sometimes. So. Uh, please do get involved in that. It would really help the Dragonfly Society if they know more. And uh, it's also a way that you can then expand your knowledge and get into recording of other kinds of creatures too. So that's what I would encourage you to follow up on, as well as 
Danielle's and Stuart's lovely ideas. Okay, thank you so much, Danielle. I really think we're better You're let you go. You must be exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> but huge thanks from us all. And um, well, good luck for your work with 2024 and especially that waiting to hear back about that um, grant application for, yeah. <laughs> for funding yourself for, for all this exciting work. Okay, and I think that's us at good night, is it? Good night, everybody. Bye. <laughs> okay, bye.